morning and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We turn the calendar to October this week, and as summer fades to autumn, the reality of the pandemic's length is setting in for many of us. And even though we have made some headway in large metropolitan cities, the number of new coronavirus infections is now disproportionately rural, with some of the highest numbers coming in from the Midwest and the Northern Great Plains. Now, we know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight, we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to get some answers straight from the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to open up our phone lines now. Join the conversation tonight, 877-731-6733. And joining us tonight from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we also welcome the UNMC Chief of Infectious Diseases tonight, Dr. Mark Rupp. Thank you both for being here. We know how busy you are. Dr. Gold, let's start with an overview. How widespread is COVID-19? in rural America tonight? Well, Christina, the numbers uh, across our nation uh, continue to go up. Uh, as the data shows, we have exceeded over uh, 7.1 uh, million confirmed cases uh, in the United States, uh, and uh, tragically, uh, just over 200,000 deaths. And by the way, we're on a fairly rapid progression to a million deaths worldwide, which would be a historic landmark of, uh, of all uh, proportions. And let's go to some of the other graphics. I think they tell some really, really important stories as to what's been happening on a day-by-day -day basis across our nation, both in terms of the number of cases. This is a look at the number of reported deaths uh, day uh, by day, uh, week by week. Since the very beginning of March, when the pandemic began to spread uh, across the United States, and what you see that there was a fairly early peak that occurred in mid in mid April and then in early May, and we went down and we continued to go down until the very early parts of July, and then with the reopening of many of our communities, states, cities, uh, sporting events, and things of that nature but not yet the reopening of schools uh, and others, uh, we started to see an escalation, uh, and which has been persistent in a pretty significant way uh, up through August uh, into September, and now almost flat uh, going into early October. If we look at the next graphic, you'll see the same thing that has to do with the uh, number of cases, but also here uh, in, the, in rural America. And this is a really interesting graphic that needs a bit of explanation for our audience. 14% uh, of America lives in one of the 2,000 approximately rural communities of our nation. And so if the disease, COVID-19, was evenly spaced out uh, in rural and in urban communities, what you would see is that 14% of the cases, 14% of the deaths would occur in both uh, in, in these same rural farming and ranching communities. But for the very early part of the pandemic, as we've discussed on this program several times, we saw a lot of the death and a lot of the new cases in the large metropolitan areas. Think the New York tri-state area, uh, think large parts of California, Florida, Texas, uh, Louisiana, North and South Carolina. But that pattern has changed, as you can see on this map, in that we're seeing the largest number of deaths. And indeed, over the last five or six weeks, approximately 20% of the deaths are occurring in the rural communities. So, and that is a dramatic change that has occurred over the last month and a half. And so I guess the message, Christina, and to our audience tonight, is that while we are working through this pandemic, doing everything we can, while we're waiting for vaccines and new antiviral therapies, and continuing to learn more and more about the virus itself, how it's spread, uh, it, it's really important to know that we, even in all of the rural communities, even in the smallest of our ranching and agricultural communities, need to continue to take precautions as we move into the fall season. And that's going to be really important as we start to talk about harvest and other things that are so important uh, during this season. So mask up. Absolutely. Yeah, farms certainly get busy this time of year, and it's easy when you get busy to let your guard down, so it's really important to have this conversation tonight. 
Dr. Rupp, we are so glad to have you back as well as Chief of Infectious Diseases at UNMC. Based on your research, at this moment, what would you say has surprised you the most about COVID-19? Uh, Christina, that's a great question. And um, frankly, I think it's actually our poor record of performance um, here in the United States. In a country of ours with such rich resources and such a great tradition with our public health agencies, the CDC, the FDA, the NIH, um, just how many times we've stumbled and um, you know, not done as well as uh, some other countries uh, throughout the world. Yeah, and you know, only time will tell when we go back. Hindsight's always 2020. We will be revisiting our response. Right now, though, we're still in the thick of it. Dr. Gold, just hours ago, President Donald Trump announced that 150 million rapid point of care tests will start going out across the country, vastly expanding U.S. testing capabilities. For those who are unfamiliar, describe how it's different from traditional testing that we've seen so far. Well, Christina, the, first of all, anything that increases access to testing, as the president knows all too well and our public health officials know, is critically important to helping control the spread of the virus. But point-of-care testing uh, is quite different from the traditional what we call PCR, nasopharyngeal swab test. And uh, it comes in multiple different varieties, but what we're particularly talking about here, I believe, uh, is the Abbott testing modality which is a nasal swab, uh, which is then placed into a liquid uh, solution carrier that then can be run uh, locally at a point of care, hence it's called a point of care test, which could be a pharmacy, a school, a church, a place of work, a university, an athletic event. And then literally in minutes or typically under an hour, you can get an answer as to whether or not uh, that specimen does contain uh, coronavirus. Now, we're testing for different things. We're either testing in the PCR world, we're looking for fragments of the genetic material from the virus. Some of these tests test for actually what we call the surface antigens of the virus, which is another way of measuring the presence of virus. But the point-of-care tests have different performance in terms of both their specificity, meaning how accurately they pick up this particular coronavirus as opposed to other coronaviruses, which may be of much less consequence, or also their sensitivity, which is how much virus you actually need in order to have a positive test. And what we know is that the traditional PCR tests are both highly specific and very sensitive, sensitive to the point of well over 90 percent for most of them and well over 95 or 98 percent specific for most of them. The point of care tests are different. Many of them are quite specific, but they're not quite as sensitive. And so what we see is a fall off in the amount of sensitivity in some of these tests, which is why the point of care tests are not really diagnostic tests, but we consider them screening tests. And so if you were to go to a large school, let's say, so for instance, University of Nebraska system is 51, 52,000 students. And if we were going to start routine testing here, we would want a screening test, not necessarily a diagnostic test. Similarly, uh, if we were looking at people who either had contacts with people who were, had COVID or had symptoms themselves, uh, we would not want a screening test. We would want a diagnostic test. So different kinds of tests, different applications. Mark, is there something you'd want to add to that or, or correct? Dr. Gold, I think that's spot on. Um, when we're really in the midst of trying to make a diagnosis in somebody, we need to have the, the most sensitive test that is available. Uh, as you've mentioned, this is generally the PCR test, and the Achilles heel of that test has been in the turnaround time. And in, in some instances, this is measured in days rather than minutes or hours. However, not in our shop, right? No, in our shop, we're doing quite well. Here at uh, the University of Nebraska Medical Center and our public health labs, uh, we have a very rapid turnaround test, generally in just slightly over 24 hours. But again, the beauty of these point-of-care tests is that you can get an answer within minutes or an hour or two of obtaining the sample, and that can be helpful, particularly when you're screening large numbers of either students or athletes or, or other groups of people. I mean, that's huge, especially when some people were having to wait five, seven, even nine days to get test results back sometimes. So I, I do have to ask you, though, when you look at how we really are going to get out of this virus, would you say that the testing plays more of a role than wearing masks? 
how do we reconcile how we get out of this? Because I think everybody has their own idea of the best way. So uh, I don't think it's an either or, uh, Christina. Uh, I think it's, it's got to be a combination of all the non-pharmacologic interventions, social distancing, wearing a mask, hand sanitizers, all the things that everybody knows by this point, and the ability to test. And if you're going to test, you have to be able to contact trace because you've got to be able to identify individuals that were exposed to infected people and then ask them to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, and that is the grail of all of this. And, uh, you know, wearing a mask and social distancing, you know, Dr. Rupp and I are more than six feet apart, hence we took off our masks. And, uh, but when we're out in public, uh, we're in meetings with other people. Uh, and by the way, I spend most of my time uh, in front of a computer screen on Zoom all day. I've been sort of Zoomed out, as they say, uh, <laughs> in most days. Uh, but... Uh, uh, all of those things are important, but if we can't test people who are exposed or people who are symptomatic and then contact trace them, we're going to have a lot harder time controlling the spread of the virus until we get to a, an acceptable, safe, and effective vaccine. Okay, so both are incredibly important. All right, let's get to some viewer questions. We love hearing from you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Our first question comes from Shelley of Oregon. She writes, somehow my brother caught coronavirus and he lives in a town of just 900 people. Are you learning anything new about the long-term health impacts of the virus? So why don't I start and then turn it over sure. to Mark. Uh, you know, we have been continuing to learn, and I would uh, describe it really as intermediate term effects, because I think it's going to be years before we know what the true long-term effects of this virus are going to be. You know, we, no one can tell you what happens a year down the line. I mean, we're still three months from the, you know, in, in three months it'll be a year since the first official case uh, was diagnosed uh, worldwide. But we are starting to see cardiac, vascular, neurological, renal uh, effects that, that seem to be sticking around. Uh, and, uh, and maybe, Mark, uh, this would be a good time for you to help us out with some of the specifics around that. Sure, Dr. Gold. I think in your preamble statements uh, to the program, you very nicely showed that this disease is, is clearly penetrating into rural areas. And that's really no surprise. Um, I think that wherever we have congregations of human beings that are not immune to this disease, and by far most of us are still not immune to this disease, we will see penetrance of the uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 in those communities. So the caller who points out that her brother is ill in a town of only 900 uh, really is of no surprise, and that's what we've continued to see as the epidemic has uh, progressed. As you've noted, uh, we're learning a lot more about the virus and the illness, and we have what we now call the long haulers. So these are people who continue to have symptoms and problems uh, weeks, months after they've had acute disease. And uh, this is unfortunately not an unusual circumstance. And this really does point out that you can be otherwise young and healthy and still have some of these manifestations that can last for a long period. And we really don't know how long that'll be. Um, as was noted, we've only had experience with this uh, virus now for less than a year. And what the ramifications are two, three, four, five years down the road, really nobody can say. Uh, some of the manifestations we're seeing more chronically are people with chronic fatigue, muscle aches, low-grade fevers. Uh, sometimes they have cognitive problems. They just, you know, have a, what they call a brain fog. And then, as you've noted, uh, there are some really serious manifestations in the cardiovascular system, neurologic system, and elsewhere as the virus uh, attacks really all organ systems. Wow. So we do know that it is possible and maybe even likely that there will be long term ramifications. But right now it's still too early to tell. That makes it even more important to keep that mask handy. Next up, Arlene from New York. Let's listen. My question is, my husband had Gillian's beret, wondering whether he will be able to get the shot for covid 19. He cannot get the flu shot. That's my question. Thank you. Great question, Arlene. So uh, as I understand it, uh, Dr. Rupp, uh, 
Her husband uh, got Guillain Barre, probably mm -hmm. as a result of a, another immunization or maybe just uh, sporadically. And is, is that going to prohibit, do you think, her husband from uh, getting a COVID immunization? Well, we don't know for sure right now. And just for the viewers, Guillain Barre is a, a very unusual neuromuscular disorder that is uh, characterized by uh, ascending paralysis. Uh, it really came to the fore back, uh, I think it was in 1976, when we had the swine flu uh, scare, and we gave a lot of people the swine flu vaccine, and there seemed to be some correlation with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, since that time, we've really not seen that, and in fact, the, the more recent data suggests that Guillain-Barre is more frequently seen with just influenza infection than with the vaccine, and so we're probably protecting against Guillain-Barre by giving the vaccine for people uh, who are prone to, uh, to influenza. Uh, we don't know the experience with the uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, we will obviously be watching that extremely closely. I would guess that if your husband had Guillain-Barre uh, a long period of time ago, it wasn't within a short period of getting the vaccine that it would be safe for them to get that vaccine. But again, um, we're, we're going to have to watch this vaccine carefully, look at the the safety data uh, before we make that statement unequivocally. So, you know, uh, Christina, I think that's a really valid point. I just want to reinforce it. One is the science has got to prevail here. That's why we do clinical trials on these new drugs, on vaccines. And we will have tens of thousands of people for each of these vaccine products who have received the vaccine. And we'll be both monitoring safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And the second thing, Arlene, I think which is really particularly important uh, is to actually have a conversation with your and your husband's uh, health care professionals and to make the decision because there may be just more than Guillain-Barre uh, in the history that weighs towards or against uh, getting immunized uh, with COVID vaccine. And maybe you might even want to think about an antibody test before you go down the road of uh, of getting immunized on the off chance uh, he might have been exposed and, and not know it. So again, when in doubt, go to your local health care professional. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and get your question in. We're going to pause for a quick break, but stay with us. We have much more to come. Rural Health Matters continues with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And tonight, we also welcome a very special guest, the UNMC Chief of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Mark Rupp joins us to take your questions. Next up is Barry of Ohio. He says, we work with custom harvesters and have an extra body extra bodies on our farm this time of year. My wife has a health condition and she's wondering if she should self quarantine while they're here. Well, Christina, this is a great question. And I think that people who are at higher risk for complications due to COVID-19 really should be taking special precautions during this time. So, um, you know, I don't know if she needs to necessarily prevent all contact, but she needs to be careful, try to maintain that physical distancing, uh, wearing a mask uh, when uh, in the proximity of others, particularly if it's in any kind of an indoor airspace, and to maintain those precautions really throughout the whole pandemic, whether or not you have uh, guest workers on the farm or not. Uh, so it's really important for those people at higher risk to, to maintain that, that guard and, and keep it up during the whole pandemic. And that would include things like shopping, going to church, uh, group meetings, uh, unfortunately, social events, uh, things of that nature as Absolutely. well, right? Okay. We have a vaccine question. We knew we were going to get at least one. I do want to point out, though, over the past two weeks, the vaccine questions coming from rural Americans has ramped way up, and that probably has something to do with the large amount of cases that we're seeing right now. Marge of Arkansas writes, has a federal plan been drawn up to ensure the availability of a COVID-19 vaccine in rural areas? Yeah, well, go ahead, please. Christina, absolutely. Every state has been charged with uh, drawing up a plan to make sure that there's equitable distribution of the vaccine and that there won't be any log jams or holdups. So, um, you know, the, those plans are in place. Uh, the federal government has been very proactive in this regard. Um, 
actually paying for the production of vaccine prior to it actually even being approved for use so that there won't be a delay in time between when it's proven efficacious and safe and when it can be released to the community. Generally what happens is you have a vaccine that's approved and then you go for months as you're trying to rev up vaccine production. In this case, it's going to be ready for, for release and the plans are drawn up on the state and local level of how to make sure that that vaccine gets from those storehouses into the arms of people very quickly. You know, that's a tough question right now is say the vaccine was approved. I, I feel like we're kind of getting to that point where at any day now, any day now, we're going to get approval on one of these vaccines. Say that were to happen tomorrow. Realistically speaking, how soon would we see vaccines distributed widely in rural America? Well, Christina, I think that, you know, what I would first emphasize is that it's extremely important that we may maintain true to the science and that these vaccines will be very carefully studied, that the, the safety data will be looked at, the efficacy data will be looked at. And so, uh, you know, the companies have pledged, the FDA has pledged very, very clearly that they're not going to rush something out uh, until it has been proven safe and effective. So that's the first thing that I would emphasize. And then once that condition occurs, um, the, the machinery is ready to distribute and to administer that vaccine. So that should happen fairly quickly. There should not be months of time in between uh, the period of approval and when administration starts. But having said that, we have nearly 300 million people in this country. We don't have 300 million doses sitting in storehouses right now. So it will take some time uh, to get fully, um, you know, the manufacturer fully revved up and distributed. But uh, again, people are being very, very proactive in this approach. And Dr. Gold, you've done such a good job of keeping us up to date on the race to the vaccine and how all these vaccines are coming along, even doing some of your own research at UNMC. Can you give us an update? Sure. Well, uh, as we just saw, there are a number of vaccines that are currently in phase three clinical trials. And that number is almost seems like it's going up by about one a week in, in recent weeks. Uh, the most uh, recent uh, addition, I believe, is a product manufactured by a company called Novadex, uh, which is a unique type of vaccine. Uh, many of the other vaccines are, are based upon the use of a relatively harmless or completely harmless virus called an adenovirus, uh, which transmits the active material. Uh, the Novadex product is a little bit different in first in that it only requires supposedly one dose as opposed to two. And secondly, it's based upon the protein complex that's on the surface of coronavirus. So it's a little bit different uh, in the way that it works. Not necessarily better, but uh, different. And which is one of the things, you know, just coming back to what Dr. Rupp just said, at the end of the day, the science has got to prevail here. And that's why we do these large clinical trials. We're looking for safety and we're looking for efficacy of these vaccines. And some will probably be better for young people. Some will be better for older people. Some will be probably specific for individuals that have medical problems uh, in addition to the age. Some uh, may be better for young children. And, you know, the trials are going to show that. And so I think that, you know, the answer to the question that most of our viewers are wondering is, how am I going to decide? And the answer is, hopefully you won't decide. Hopefully what you'll do is you'll reach out to your healthcare professional, somebody that you really trust, and you'll say, listen, you know, there's one or two or five vaccines on the, on the market. You know me. You've been taking care of me for some period of time. Which vaccine do you think is right for me? Uh, and you'll get a frank and you'll get an honest answer uh, from your healthcare professional. And if and if the answer is, I don't know, because the science is not available to me, uh, that would give me a good deal of pause and a good deal of concern. So I think the sharing of the science behind these clinical trials is going to be absolutely critical to have the healthcare professionals, the doctors, the pharmacists, the advanced practice nurses, et cetera, make patient-specific information available. And once that happens, I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. But I agree with Dr. Rupp. Once the uh, Food and Drug Administration approves emergency youth authorization and the data gets out as to the efficacy on the clinical trial, uh, I think the healthcare profession is going to be very prepared uh, to make recommendations. 
And I think the states are going to be very prepared to distribute the vaccine to both rural and urban communities. Yeah, and, and Dr. Gold, I think uh, your, your statements are really um, spot on. And it's somewhat analogous to influenza vaccine. I mean, we have trivalent vaccine, quadrivalent vaccine. We have an eggs-free vaccine for people with egg allergy. We have a high antigen dose vaccine for people who are a little bit older in age. Uh, we have a recombinant vaccine, a vaccine that's delivered via nasal mist uh, in the nose. Uh, there's intradermal vaccines. So, you know, as you mentioned, uh, this is going to be evolving. and We're going to have to figure out which form of the vaccine is best for which population. All right. Such helpful guidance. I feel like you're only going to find that on this show, Rural Health Matters. Really appreciate both of you. We're going to go back to the phones now. Elaine from Missouri is up next. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Yes, I would like to know if a person has got the virus and they walk by you or you were in contact with them or even someone that's carrying that virus, how long would it be before you knew you caught the virus from them or if you did? Yeah, so that's a, a very good question and it points out a lot of questions about the transmission and pathogenesis of this infection. So uh, what we've learned over time is that people can uh, be shedding the virus um, sometimes before they are sick or perhaps they have a very mild disease or maybe totally asymptomatic. Uh, they can shed that virus and spread it to other people. If you are going to develop symptoms, typically the incubation period is somewhere in the neighborhood of about five to six days, can be as short as maybe two days or as long as 14 days. Once you're past that 14-day period, you're pretty much out of the woods and uh, you won't be uh, harboring the vaccine or, or, I mean, the virus or uh, shedding the virus at that point. And how, you know, just walking past somebody, you know, we typically talk about under six feet, more than 15 minutes, right? But is, is that a rule of thumb that you think is pretty reliable these days? Yeah, I think that is a good rule of thumb. And generally, we're seeing that it takes um, fairly close contact with people over a longer period of time to get uh, the, the transmission. So again, fleeting com uh, contact of walking past somebody, particularly if it's outdoors and there's lots of air uh, and with that's a mask. Uh, mixing. And if you're wearing a mask and if that other person's wearing a mask, the chances of transmission are extremely limited. If you're sitting in the same automobile on a you know, multi-hour trip, uh, without uh, wearing masks and that other person is shedding virus, there's a really good chance that you will contract yeah, the disease. Yeah, you're probably in trouble. Yep. All right, next up is Earl of Montana. He says, I drive a truck and make a lot of runs between farms and grain elevators this time of year. Now that we're getting into flu season, how can I tell the difference between the symptoms of a cold and COVID? That's a good ID question. Yeah, it is a good question. I, I guess I would emphasize a few things. While he's driving uh, by himself in his truck, obviously he's at no risk. When he gets to those stops where he's interacting with other people, he should be wearing a mask and they should be wearing a mask and trying to prevent transmission. Uh, unfortunately, the symptoms of influenza and COVID-19 can be very similar. And that's why it's even more important this year to get the flu vaccine so that you don't run in to that, uh, that uh, confusion between the two diseases. And uh, the COVID-19 has a wide spectrum of symptoms, can be anything from mild symptoms or even asymptomatic, all the way up to life-threatening illness with lower respiratory tract disease in our ICU on mechanical ventilation. The most typical symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, but we also see people who have a sudden loss of the sense of taste or smell is very characteristic. They can also have muscle aches. We're starting to see some uh, gastrointestinal overlay with nausea and vomiting. All these things are, are symptoms of uh, COVID-19. And it's really, the, it's the progression, though, that really distinguishes between the two, in that it's the COVID patients that much more frequently end up hospitalized and tragically in intensive care or even passing away from the disease. And that's because of the progressive spread uh, into the lower respiratory tract. Would that be right? That's correct. It starts in the upper respiratory tract and then unfortunately moves into the lower respiratory tract. And then from there, we really see it invading the vascular system and causing kind of a, a revving up of the inflammatory response that causes some of the other manifestations in really all of the organ systems. So kidneys, liver, brain, heart, everything can be affected. And as you mentioned, this disease is... Uh, probably at least five to 10 times more severe than influenza. So it's not something you want to trifle with. 
even if you're young and healthy, you don't have any of those underlying comorbid illnesses, um, it's still something that you want to try to avoid if you possibly can. You know, as this graphic shows, I think pretty clearly that there are multiple stages here from the stage where people have no symptoms and then those that get symptoms can either be severe or, or not so severe. But then it's not just the viral response, but as you were talking about earlier, it's this hyperinflammatory phase, and so what we call a cytokine storm that seems to produce the lasting damage. And you know, we've had uh, previous discussions uh, on the show uh, with actually uh, Dr. Anderson, who mm -hmm. is the uh, chair of our uh, infectious diseases division, uh, infectious Cardiology. diseases, cardiovascular division, excuse me, on, on the potential long-term cardiac effects due to this inflammatory uh, effect. All right. We are getting a lot of calls this evening. Sometimes viewers don't want to come on live TV, and we understand. That's Ronnie of Oklahoma, but we still want to get his question out there. Ronnie wants to know, when the vaccine comes out, do you think it will cost about the same as a flu vaccine? And if not, will it be free? My understanding is right now um, this is being underwritten uh, by our federal government and there should be little or negligible cost associated with receiving the vaccine for COVID-19, particularly in this initial phase. Okay, good question, Ronnie. Our next question comes from Diane in Arizona and she has a question about testing. Let's listen. And I was just wondering uh, how accurate both the nasal swab and the serology test are. Do they know? Has it gotten any better since the beginning? Thank you. Yeah, so I can uh, take a first crack at that. And clearly we are having innovations and improvement in testing. Uh, this is an evolving field and as we get better at it, we are learning that we can uh, uh, sample the, the respiratory tract in different places. So uh, instead of doing the nasopharyngeal swab, there is work on trying to do swabs uh, more uh, uh, you know, shallow in the nose, if you will, oropharyngeal swabs or even saliva testing, all of which may be uh, more comfortable and, and a little bit easier on patients to, to have those uh, tests performed. All right, we are getting a lot of great questions tonight. Please keep them coming. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to take a quick break, but we still have much more Rural Health Matters coming your way with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And tonight we also welcome the UNMC Chief of Infectious Diseases, Dr. Mark Rupp. Over the commercial break, Brad from Minnesota called and he wants to know if growing a beard is a good idea in the winter months during this pandemic. Um, I think uh, growing a beard probably won't have much effect on the uh, transmission of the disease unless it interferes with how close the mask is able to fit to the face. And so if it's a, um, you know, a short beard, well-groomed, I don't think it will have a major impact. If it's a large beard that's going to prevent the mask from fitting more tightly to the face, it probably would not be a good idea. You know, I think we've seen that with the uh, fit testing for the N95 respirators. Absolutely and that uh, in most instances, as you say, for a, a tightly groomed uh, beard, uh, you know, no problem. But when it starts to get uh, thicker, uh, the fit goes down and therefore the protection significantly changes. No ZZ Top beards this winter. Right. <laughs> wow, that was a good question. And you know what, a surprising answer. We appreciate that. Thank you for that question. Brad from Minnesota. Okay, Barbara from South Carolina is next. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. My question is, once you get the COVID-19, um, why do it affect everybody so differently? And how long do you stay in, in quarantine? We stayed at 14 days. But why do it affect everybody so differently? Barbara, that's a fantastic question, and it really underscores uh, the things that we still need to learn about this disease, and that is, why are there two people who look exactly the same and yet have very, very different outcomes from the disease? Uh, we're starting to get some glimpses of that, and it's probably due 
to underlying immunologic forces and how people interact with the virus. So you may have heard, for instance, that certain blood types actually have a correlation with people's um, outcomes with COVID-19. Now, it's probably not the blood type, but that may be a marker for other immunologic processes that indicate how a person interacts and responds to the virus. So there's a lot we have yet to learn about uh, why, again, some people do well and some people uh, die from this. But that's true of so many other diseases, Mark, you know, whether it's influenza. I mean, we know there are risk factors, age, comorbidity, et cetera, for all diseases. Yes. But even if you were to match age and gender and race and ethnicity and comorbidity and so many other things, there are still a lot of unexplained factors as to how diseases are transmitted and, and who gets the really severe case or, heaven forbid, passes away and, and who is barely symptomatic and just looks well and feels well and goes back to school or goes back to work. Yeah, no, we've seen these stories of a, you know, a husband and wife who both get ill at the same time. One ends up in the ICU, one stays uh, asymptomatic. And so uh, we really do have yet a lot to learn about this illness. Speaking of which, the guidance regarding the illness, I mean, we see the CDC come out with, with guidelines one day and then they come out maybe a week later and they change course. It's been really, really difficult for a lot of us because it's made it a little bit confusing. So let's talk about where we can go to find good information. Dr. Gold, I know you have to have some resources for us. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of comments about that, Christina. The, the guidance is going to continue to change, and I think we have to accept that. And the reason being is this is a brand new disease that we have less than a year of experience with. And as we learn more about transmission, as we learn more about treatment, as we learn more about how people become immune, just coming back to the last question about... Uh, you know, why some people get a severe case and some people don't. We don't know the answer to that question just yet, but we will figure that out. And when we do, the guidance is going to change. So I always recommend uh, people go to their local public health department or their state public health department for information. We still do refer to the CDC website uh, whenever possible. And of course, many of our large universities, including ours, uh, you know, and I'm very proud of our uh, GCHS, the Global Center for Health Security work, our College of Public Health, our Division of Infectious Diseases. You know, we work very hard to put what we believe to be best practices on the website, try to advise our students, faculty, and staff, try to advise the communities that we serve, and, and frankly, continually change our recommendations based, again, purely on the science. You have, you have preferred sources, Mark, that, that you recommend folks go to? Yeah, I, I agree with those comments. I think that, um, you know, people do have to understand that changes in guidance doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the initial guidance was wrong. It just simply means that they made recommendations based upon the best evidence at that time. And then as additional data is accrued, those guidance statements can be updated and changed. And as you mentioned, uh, they're going to continue to do that. We have had an absolute explosion of data. I actually did a, a literature search on this uh, topic uh, here in the last week. And over the last two to three months, there's been an average of 14,000 papers per month on, um, wow. on COVID-19. This is almost 500 papers a day that are coming out that uh, just shows that the world scientific community is very, very much focused on this. And so there, there is an expanding uh, body of data um, that is really very, very difficult to keep up with even. And so you will see changes as uh, we get smarter about this. So again, just so our audience understands, we're not talking about newspaper articles. We're talking about peer-reviewed scientific publications, right? These are articles that are ap appearing in the medical literature, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow, 500 a day, a day. Amazing. What human has time to read and then process, analyze, and think through all that information? Interesting. Really appreciate you kind of giving us a look at what it's like to be in your shoes during this pandemic. All right, we're going to go back to the phone. Sarah from Ohio is next. Go right ahead. Sarah, can you hear us? Hello. Hi, go right ahead. Yes, I'm here, but... Do you have a question for the doctors? You can go ahead and ask. 
Uh, yes. In 1962, my late husband and I went to Europe. And before we went, we had to have the malaria and typhoid shots. Now, I got very, very sick from malaria. Uh, I had to stay in bed, and the doctor gave me shots to help me through it. And my passport says that I'm never to have the malaria shots again because I am immune from it. Does that help me with this uh, Chinese virus? Yeah, I'm afraid uh, that your past experience with uh, malaria prophylaxis or uh, uh, treatment for typhoid really will not have bearing on the COVID-19 uh, viral infection. They're very, very different. So I would uh, approach this uh, kind of de novo from a new spot and just uh, go with the, the current recommendations on how to either prevent or treat uh, COVID-19. And I, I guess I would uh, discount a little bit uh, that past experience that you had with uh, malaria and uh, typhoid fever. All right. Thank you for that call, Sarah. Violet is our next caller. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead, Violet. Okay, my question is, I've heard that vitamin D3 helps prevent catching the coronavirus, and I would like to know if there's any truth to that. That's all. Yeah, that's, that's another great question, and we know that uh, a lot of people are vitamin D deficient, uh, particularly in the winter months uh, when it gets colder and darker and people are not outside. We've also known for really a very long time that vitamin D does have an effect on making the immunologic system work more efficiently. Now, I don't think that there's necessarily a close linkage or association between uh, taking supplemental vitamin D and truly having an effect against COVID-19, but the better that your immunologic system is tuned up and ready to respond to a challenge, the better off you're going to be. I think it's very reasonable, particularly during the winter months, to supplement with vitamin D. You know, I was going to say, Mark, that uh, certainly for people that are vitamin D deficient, uh, supplementing with vitamin D is probably a good idea to enhance their immune function. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there are uh, associative data showing that deficiencies of vitamin D when looking at a population basis do seem to correlate with worse outcome or a susceptibility to COVID-19. But again, it's just an association. There isn't really causative information. We don't know what that interaction is uh, in a real intricate way. But again, if your immune system is, is tuned up and doing the best that it can, it only is going to serve you better if you get challenged with COVID-19. The other things that you should obviously be doing is sort of what your grandma told you, you know, make sure you're getting enough rest, get uh, a good balanced diet, make sure you're getting enough exercise, all those things that will help your immune system be uh, functioning at its peak performance. All right, 877-731-6733 is the number to call with your question. Next, we have Randall of Idaho. He says, we're cattle ranchers with three school-aged children and the caretakers of my 82-year-old father. Realistically, when is the soonest that he will be able to get a vaccine? Yeah, Christine, again, a great question. We are all, you know, guardedly optimistic that we're going to see uh, an approval of a vaccine, uh, perhaps as early as sometime yet this calendar year. And then we're very hopeful that we'll be able to get that distributed and start to administer it uh, either late this year or early next year. That's about the best prognostication I can give you. Um, I, I wish I knew an exact date, but I, I don't think anybody knows that right you now. You know, there, there are vaccines that are currently being widely used uh, through China, through Russia, uh, other parts of the world. But these are not vaccines that have gone through the same type of clinical testing rigor that we expect uh, in, in this country. And while it may seem attractive, particularly for higher risk people, you know, why can't I get it? Uh, frankly, you know, my recommendation is we want to be darn sure that the vaccine is both effective and safe. And, uh, and that's why we need to be patient until we have a tested and proven product. You know, therapies have kind of built a bridge in the meantime before we have a vaccine. Can you tell us more about how the therapies are working out? Are we seeing any new research that looks promising there? Oh, absolutely. Um, and when you look at, again, this is a completely novel disease to us, really 
In the last nine months, we've been able to discover a number of medications that can help to, to treat this. Uh, we've clearly gotten better with just supportive care, uh, giving people fluids and different types of uh, supplemental oxygen, mechanical ventilation, anticoagulation. But some of the medications that have really come out to show a, uh, a proven effect would be uh, an antiviral called remdesivir, also a steroid called dexamethasone. Uh, there are uh, ongoing studies of different drugs in combination with remdesivir. Um, so these are the things that are really pushing forward. Some of the monoclonal antibodies are in uh, studies now to show whether they're effective or not. There are really literally dozens of ongoing studies to discern uh, the best way of treating people with COVID-19. And it is an area of excitement and optimism. Uh, clearly, as, as we work towards getting a vaccine, we've also been working towards how to best treat the people who are sick today. You know, if you look at the data uh, nationally, that it used to be that almost everybody that ended up in an intensive care unit ended up on a ventilator. And that has now significantly changed uh, across the country. First of all, a far smaller percentage of people are getting hospitalized. A smaller percentage of those being hospitalized end up in an intensive care unit. And now only about a third of those that are going to an intensive care unit, at least in the state of Nebraska, actually end up on a ventilator, which one, keeps the ventilators available for those that very much need it, but secondly, enhances survival, frankly. And so we have seen the death rates continue to fall, as tragic as they have been, you know, now exceeding 200,000 uh, American deaths, which is almost half as many as the total number of people who died during the Second World War, which is an amazing statistic. But the percentage of individuals, even for the older folks and those with other comorbid conditions, are doing better. So these therapies continue to get better day by day and week by week. So a very important point as we move through this. The other thing I would emphasize, Dr. Gold, is that it's really important for people to understand that the best way to better treat people is to do carefully crafted, well-controlled studies. Rather than rushing something forward on a, on a shred of data and a lot of hope, it's better to spend a little bit more time doing a carefully controlled study so at the end of the day, you're able to actually say, yes, this is helpful, and yes, this is safe. And uh, you know, or I'm very not. proud, or not, and I'm very proud of the fact that here at uh, the Nebraska Medical Center, Dr. Khalil and his colleagues uh, we're really some of the pioneers in pushing forward some of these really carefully controlled, what we call adaptive studies. So they very, very quickly ascertain whether something is helpful or not, and then they add the next building block or the next step to that study so that, that they can have an improvement upon the new control. Some of the most important work in the country right now being done, the research on this virus coming out of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Richard from Ohio is our next caller. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead, Richard. Yes, I would, I would like to know if there is any residual effects from the vaccines or the coronavirus in the, down, in the years down the road. Thank you. Yeah, Richard, so, so clearly there are long-term effects of uh, natural infection from COVID-19. We don't know how long some of those effects will be. Uh, we've talked a little bit that, uh, about that earlier in the program, that people can kind of have a, a chronic uh, fatigue type of syndrome that may linger for months. Uh, perhaps some of these symptoms may even linger longer than that. Clearly, the studies are ongoing to discern the safety of the uh, coronavirus vaccine. And again, I would emphasize that uh, you know, this vaccine will not be released by the companies or the FDA until it's really been proven both effective and safe. All right, thank you for that. We appreciate your call, Richard. Dr. Rupp, since we have you on set tonight, I have to ask you as an infectious disease expert in the middle of a pandemic, what does a typical day look like for you now and what did it look like at the beginning? Well, Christine, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, that things are um, uh, calmed down a little bit. Um, you know, clearly the days are still long and very busy, but I would be the first one to say it, really the true heroes in this are the critical care nurses, the critical care doctors, the physicians and the allied health personnel, uh, the emergency department uh, personnel, the first responders that, you know, every single day go to work and are really putting themselves in the line of danger. 
And uh, those are the true heroes uh, of this whole pandemic. Um, you know, they've been working really night and day for months. And I do think that folks need to understand that, uh, you know, there is some uh, fatigue that's setting in. You know, people talk about the fatigue of the quarantine and of the, uh, the pandemic and not wanting to wear a mask or to socially distance. Um, think about those healthcare care providers that have been day in and day out for months uh, working around the clock. That's where the real fatigue has set in. And so, again, I, I would just say that my days are better than they were back in March and April. Uh, but clearly, the people I would like to recognize would be those folks who are in the units taking care of these patients, my ICU nurses, my emergency doctors, uh, all of those folks who are really putting it on the line every day. God bless them. Dr. Gold, we had a lot of discussions leading up to the reopening of schools. Have you noticed any trends after seeing school kids and college students even go back to the traditional classroom setting? Sure. So the, uh, the current data uh, shows about 130,000 or maybe slightly more than that college students are thought to be infected based upon recent testing. And that represents thousands of universities uh, across the country reporting those statistics. Now we know that that's underestimating the total number because there are about 17 million students, believe it or not, that are in college or attending college level courses uh, at any given time. But one of the things we've learned here, and I think the trend has been shown to be true across the country, is that most of the viral spread does not occur in the classroom or in the residential hall, uh, but it occurs at social events, group gatherings, you know, Friday night or Saturday night at the local watering hole, or maybe uh, an event uh, in, uh, in a fraternity or sorority where people may not uh, be using the best uh, social distancing, they may not be wearing their masks, uh, but those numbers continue to go up. I mean, recent statistics here uh, in Nebraska have shown that about half of the new cases uh, week over week are now in college-age students, and many of them, frankly, don't even live on the college campuses, so these are community-acquired cases. And unfortunately, uh, the statistics have shown that they're starting to transmit those to their parents and to their grandparents, who end up hospitalized in emergency rooms and other such things. So we're working really, really hard on the college population to uh, try to get them uh, to be as thoughtful and responsible uh, as possible. And I'm really proud to say that, uh, you know, here in Nebraska, we've got some great college kids and, uh, and they really get it and they're doing their best. Everybody's happy about college football being back. That is definitely an overwhelming response that I've noticed. All right, I just want to thank you both so much for joining us. It's so important to continue to do these shows, especially as we're seeing rural America now showing some of the hot spots in the country. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and UNMC Chief of Infectious Diseases Dr. Mark Rupp. Thank you both for joining us. Now, you are such a big part of the show. If we didn't get a chance to get your question answered tonight, maybe you had to hang on the phone, you can leave us a voice recording on our hotline. I want to make sure you have this number. You might want to grab a pen or a pencil. 855-776-6147. I'm going to give it to you one more time. 855-776-6147. You can call our hotline, leave us a recording, and we will get your question answered on Monday night's show. Remember, Rural Health Matters airs every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 Central, right here on Rural America's Most important network. You can also find past shows. Watch RFDTV.com has our library. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you back here next week. Wishing you and those you love a beautifully blessed evening.